Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Community Living Month. I want to welcome you to today's webinar, Privatization and Developmental Services, What's Ahead? My name is Sean Pegg. I'm Director of Social Policy and Strategic Initiatives uh, at Community Living Ontario. I want to start by acknowledging that I live and work on the unceded territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe and Wendat peoples, and that this land is currently home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. Joining me today as, as presenters are Pat Armstrong, Distinguished Research Professor Emeritus at York University, and Megan Linton, a PhD student, writer, and researcher who has written extensively on developmental services and institutions. I also want to thank Eon Sinclair and Shamil Anwar for technical assistance today. So I'd like to give just a bit of context before we get started with our presenters. As many of you will know, we have a new strategy for developmental services in Ontario called uh, Journey to Belonging, Choice and Inclusion. The new strategy promises to change the way the developmental service sector is funded in Ontario and to promote healthy competition among providers. The strategy promises that people will have more choice and control over the services and funding they need and that they'll be able to choose their service providers. <clears throat> in the next couple of minutes, I'm gonna say some positive things about this, and then I'm gonna raise some worries about journey to belonging, specifically about privatization and profit-making. Currently, the bulk of developmental service funding uh, flows in block grants to agencies, and to a very large degree, uh, money is attached to system vacancies rather than to people. So it can be quite difficult for a person uh, to move away from a situation that they are unhappy with, which is obviously not ideal. And I'm just setting aside uh, the passport program for the moment. For years, uh, people, families, and many uh, system stakeholders, including Community Living Ontario, have been calling for the creation of a system where money follows the person and people have choice and control over funding and services which Journey to Belonging promises to do. Uh, so that's the positive part. And at the same time, uh, Journey to Belonging is likely to open up uh, increasing opportunities for, for profit providers to enter the developmental service system uh, or to increase their role in the system. And we're already seeing this in a few ways. Uh, for example, we see it in uh, private day programs uh, funded by passport contributions, in the recent growth of temporary staffing agencies serving the sector, in private for-profit group homes that receive flow-through dollars from transfer payment agencies, and in the lodging sector that Megan is going to talk about. We're also seeing increasing opportunities for profit-making in employment services, in autism services, and in healthcare in Ontario. Um, so, you know, the opportunity for even more privatization in the sector is concerning because we can see the effects that privatization and profit making have had in Ontario's home care sector and in our long term care sector, uh, including in long term care, uh, you know, the fact that COVID death rates were quite significantly higher in for profit homes. With all of this in mind, I thought it would be informative to learn about the history of privatization and profit making in long term care so we have a better idea of what things we should be alert to in developmental services, uh, which is why we have Pat Armstrong with us today. Additionally, I thought it would be uh, instructive to learn about some of the private interests that are already involved in developmental services, which Megan is going to cover. With that as context and background, I'd like to ask Pat Armstrong to start us off. I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important uh, for the whole context in, in terms of the issues that are being raised. There's a there's a lot of confusion about what we mean by private and public, and thus about privatization. So we have been understanding privatization as the move away from shared responsibility for the collective provision of and control over goods and services that provide for our community needs. Uh, just a second, I'm having trouble here. With screen just changed on me for some reason. Um, sorry about that. Uh, 
the control over goods and services that provide for our community and for our individual needs, but doing so through democratic decision-making and respectful work processes. We've also found it useful to think in terms of different forms of privatization. And I want to talk about six forms and as Sean just indicated, referencing a long-term care in particular, in addition to a few other areas of health services. So the first and most obvious form of privatization is the one that Sean just talked about, for-profit ownership, which is to be distinguished from the forms of private, other forms of private ownership that are not seeking profit. Because by law and practice, for-profit organizations must have profit as their primary objective. And their primary responsibility is to their owners, not the public or their funders, even when their funding is mainly public. Um, I meant the funders in terms of uh, private equity. So the ownership takes some visible and some less visible forms. Again, some of what we just heard about. It can be the ownership of the land the service is on, of the building itself, of the entire service delivery or parts of delivery, or it could be all of those. Privately owning the land, the building and operating what is primarily publicly funded services. Now, contrary to the popular defense of these kinds of privatizations, they do not very often mean more innovation, more cost savings for the public, better quality, or more choice. In uh, Ontario long-term care, where nearly 60% of the nursing homes are for profit, and that's which is much higher than other provinces, the evidence is clear that staffing, retention rates, pay, and quality of care are lower. These homes send more residents to the hospital where care costs us all more. And where most, uh, and these are, as Sean just rest, mentioned, where uh, many more residents died during COVID compared to the uh, not for profit and public. Not surprisingly, then, these publicly funded for profit homes are often the last choice of those needing care. And given that all of, of them receive the same kinds of public funds, there are no cost savings to having the for-profits on them. And the only innovation seems to be innovations in how to make a profit. Now we see similar patterns in publicly funded uh, home care services as we just heard. Now it doesn't stop there in terms of for-profit ownership. Within nonprofit and publicly owned homes, for-profit ownership can include the staff in the temp agencies, for example, that we just heard about, contracted services like food, housekeeping, laundry, security, and even for-profit management that is being hired in some of the not-for-profit homes especially. And the costs are higher to the public purse compared to having employers do the work to have these contracted out services. In Ontario long-term care, for example, a temp agency charges $150 an hour for an RN, uh, sorry, a day for the RN, charges that do not include the 35% surcharge called the agencies, while the RN staff are usually paid around $60 an hour. So it's, it's more than double. Meanwhile, the employer of the contracted services have precarious employment and service quality is lower than it is with in-house service because continuity and the costs are higher to the public purse compared to having employees of the home. It's also important to note that owners are increasingly giant international corporations or private equity firms with no hesitation in closing a home if they can make a bigger profit from the land, as we've seen with 20 homes closing in Ontario. And they're moving uh, these for-profit firms into virtual care and to the management of doctor practices, among other things that Sean mentioned. So that's one form of privatization. Our second form is the privatization of managerial practices. Along with neoliberalism in the last century, the notion that governments and their services should copy managerial practices from the for-profit sector to make them more efficient and more effective while improving quality became a major force in public services. Run them like a business, not a, like a public service. The number of managers grew along with performance indicators, increasing documentation and more surveillance of the work and of the workers, as well as less job security. 
These are combined with a focus on competition for government contracts and more parsimonious use of resources so that the lowest bidder gets to uh, provide the service and that may, may mean the lowest quality as well. And like just in time production, it's just enough care or just enough teachers or barely enough and not enough as became increasingly clear uh, with the pandemic. Part-time casual contracted employment and precarity increased while benefits and unions protections declined and the public sector wages and benefits came under attack. Such managerial strategies increased in equities along with increasing precarity for the workers. Now, my third form of privatization is the privatization of payment. Many of the increases in fees are obvious, or at least become obvious when you go to pay at the optometrist's office. But less obvious is the shift to private payment when public services disappear, are cut back, or fail to demand to, sorry, fail to expand to build the demand. To once again use the case of long-term care, current estimates indicate that 40,000 people assessed as requiring long-term care are on the waiting list. And we don't know how many are waiting or for or going without home care, mental health services, or other community living supports, unless of course you're rich enough to pay for them privately. Now my fourth form of privatization is the privatization of work, of the labor that goes into providing care. By cutting back and by not providing enough staff or enough services or enough funding, governments are shifting the work to those unpaid for the labor. When there are not enough teachers or care workers or daycare spaces or home care services, for example, necessary labor is either left undone or left to be done by those unpaid for the job. Sean tells me that there are some 20,000 people who won't make it off the wait list for supports and services before their main caregiver dies. Uh, until then, it is up to the family to fill the void for those who have family, of course. Sometimes the work is taken up by those otherwise paid for the job. And most of those who take up this unpaid work at home or in the labor force are women. And those with the least financial resources are likely to provide more of this unpaid care. So my fifth form of privatization is the privatization of decision-making with profitization, which is I think what we should call it instead of privatization comes the right to secrecy in corporations mainly responsible to their boards. Sometimes it's hard to even follow the money to the owners and find out who they are. And the reporting data we do have often obscure more than they reveal. The lack of transparency is combined with a lack of public control, an absence that becomes particularly obvious when corporations go bankrupt or simply decide to leave because profits are too low. And of course, even if we had better data and could identify easily who owns them, we will still need governments to hold these organizations accountable. And we have little evidence that that is actually happening. Indeed, we see the reverse in some cases. For example, the Ontario government introduced liability shield legislation to protect nursing homes from lawsuits in the wake of COVID. And they're giving new funding to homes that had the military in because their care was so bad. At the same time, individual purchases of services or investment in them can also shape the extent to which services are privatized, providing another limit on collective governance. So finally, uh, on my six forms, there is the privatization of our heads. All of these forms of privatization help undermine our commitment to public services and to public supports. Increasingly, we are not only held responsible for the services that we and our families need, we are also held responsible for services and for our own health, what has been called responsabilization. And it seems to make sense that we need to tighten our belts after all this public expenditure during COVID. And if we're going to really fight these various forms of privatization, we have to resist the temptation to think that this is only common sense. So in conclusion for my 20 minutes, I hope I haven't gone over, uh, 
dis dissecting the various forms of privatization helps us see how the various forms are undermining not only our access to services and supports while making care work more precarious. They are also undermining our sense of our shared responsibility for care while still having us pay for much of this privatization directly as individuals or collectively through our taxes. To get at the core of privatization, I think we should insist on talking about it as profitization, at the ways the search for profit is making us care less and undermining equity. This term can make it clear that these for-profit organizations are required to search for profits, transforming public services and supports, along with the work involved to carry out those services in ways that undermine our fundamental rights, our control over our collective funds, and our solidarity. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Pat. You're actually you're actually ahead of time. Um, so, I always try and be careful to make sure I don't go over. <laughs> so I'm just wondering. Um, you talk about your preference for the word uh, profitization. Um, can you just explain a bit more why you prefer that term over the term privatization? Uh, because we hear a lot of confusion about private. I, uh, in nominally, a Mount Sinai Hospital is private in the sense that it's not owned by the government, but it falls onto the under the Public Hospitals Act. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm not used to talking this much in a row. Um, and and it it doesn't search for a profit, and it has a, a public board that we can, in the sense that we can know what goes on uh, inside it and have some influence over it. But so if we call all of this private, we we mix up a hospital like Mount Sinai with a, a home care long term care home that is owned by an international corporation that is uh, making a profit out of care. So uh, it also identifies, I think, what, what the central problems are, that the money's going to profit and not to care. It's that simple. And it's not going to the people who provide the care and it's not uh, going to the people who need the care. So um, why should our tax dollars go in, in that direction? And that was actually my next question. Um, what do you say to those who would argue that uh, we need for-profit providers uh, in order to address all the need that's out there, that without opening up the systems to profitization, uh, there will continue to be uh, this underserving of populations who need service and support. Well, I think that we can afford the health care we want. We have to figure that out. And uh, that we have been in our project that's been going on for 10 years in terms of long-term care, trying to make it uh, a place where people are treated with dignity and respect, whether they are providing the care or whether they are the people who uh, need spe have specific care needs. Um, and if you go to homes in Scandinavia, for instance, as we have in uh, Norway and Sweden, and in Germany, I would say as well, that they do provide a whole range of services, not just in long-term care, because they make those choices. They make those choices in terms of taxes and they make those choices in terms of the provision of care. So um, I, we can get what we can afford. If we think of the public-private partnerships are often promoted in the terms you suggested, but the research shows they call, cost us more publicly in the long run than if we put up that money ourselves for the capital. The capital argument is often the argument that's made. And there isn't any great deal of evidence to indicate that they're better at it than the not-for-profits. And, and in fact, there's a lot of research in terms of public-private partnerships indicating they not only cost more, but they often end up with, with per, poorer quality everything. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Pat. Um, and perhaps uh, one, one last question. Um, can you, uh, 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 I'll let everyone know that, that Pat has edited a book called uh, The Privatization of Care, 
the case of nurse, nursing homes, which is very helpful and informative. And in the book, uh, you talk, uh, there's, there's mention of the privatization and use of private companies for things like food services, laundry. Can you talk a little bit more about that kind of uh, outsourcing of key aspects of social service agencies? Well, it, it's interesting to me that we, for some reason, separate out food, uh, clothing, shelter, jobs and joy from each other. Um, and I would argue that uh, laundry services and food services and cleaning services are all critical components of care. And are, are there people who do that work are central to the research team, to the research team, sorry, to the care team, doing too much research these days. Um, and that uh, it, when we go into homes, as, as we've done, I have studied more than 40 homes in six countries. By study, I mean, we've gone in with research teams and spent more than a week in them. Talk to everybody who works in and lives in. What we hear first is um, about the food. And that's most common in the places that have contracted out services. Um, and we were in one home where there was a big sign up in the dining room that said, do not talk to the dietary staff. The dietary staff were employees of a contracted big corporation and uh, they were supposed to get in and out with the food as fast as possible, which is of course then makes uh, dining a really enjoyable experience. Um, and whole plates of food are plunked in front of, of older people who uh, then get turned off eating totally because the, the stuff's too big or the plate has things they hate on it or whatever. And of course, this dietary staff has no knowledge about what the individuals like to eat. The trays come with people's name on them because they don't know who the residents are. The other, we often also hear about uh, mom's sweater that one of the, the most important indicators of our self that we take with us into long-term care is our clothing. And if that's taken off us and boiled in a factory far away um, and comes back half the size and anyway is on our neighbor, um, we've taken away so much of our personal dignity and respect. And, uh, and the, uh, the other thing I would say about the, the housekeeping staff, they're often in long-term care, the people who actually spend uh, time chatting, talking with, uh, understanding uh, the people for whom they are providing uh, that care work. So if we contract that out, not only is it costing us more money than it would if we did it ourselves, uh, but it takes the whole care out of the out of the uh, care package. So I think, well, and, and also, of course, it means a, a dramatic disruption in continuity of care. And I'm sure everyone on this call uh, knows how important it is for the person who is supporting you to know who you are and uh, to, to know you as a person over time. And you, can, you can't do that if you are popping in for an hour to provide a food service. I could go on, I'm passionate, especially about these eh, food, food laundry. And, and we, in fact, we've written a whole book called Wash, Wear and Care, if you're interested. Well, Pat, your, your, your work on this brings such nuance and detail to this conversation, which can be quite cloudy and, and high level. So I, I really appreciate your work and I really appreciate you being able Thank to be you. with us today. Um, before we go to Megan, I just wanna, I should clarify, we had a question about um, which services in, develop, in, in the DS sector will be private. Um, you know, I, I need to absolutely clarify that um, everything is still quite unknown about where Journey to Belonging is going. Um, I think when you look at what a few experts are saying, they are um, noting that they're may well be increasing opportunities um, to make a profit or to earn money in different ways in the system. So we don't know where it's heading. Uh, and the, the reason we wanted to have this webinar today is just to bring people's attention to it, 
clearly there's an interest and a concern. Um, and I think we need to uh, continue having these kinds of conversations as we start to learn more about where the new uh, strategy is going. Uh, so Megan, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, hello. It's so wonderful to be here and to hear from so many folks about the impact of privatization already. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more of a um, direct route and show you some of the conditions of institutionalization in privatized settings that are already occurring in Ontario. Um, and I want to be um, to just give a little warning that I will be showing pictures and images of um, these places. And so um, just a content note, but I'm going to. Got a little uh, early rendition. OK. Sorry, screen sharing gets you every time. Okay, we're good. Okay, so I'm going to be telling you about the story of domiciliary hostels. And don't worry if you've never heard of them, that would make you the majority of Ontario residents. And so um, don't worry, we'll get to that. And these are represent a small case study in privatization, similar to how Pat was talking about the issues in long-term care and how we can see these continuities between um, the systems and the real risks of privatization. And that's what I want to drive home today is that privatization comes with fundamental risks that we have to be aware of and we have to be working towards understanding and fighting against together. Um, so uh, note that this that this presentation will include discussion of institutionalization, forced medication, and neglect. And it will show some pretty shocking images, one which includes a rodent. I'll let you know before it happens. So under our contemporary austerity regime that guides provincial developmental services, there is a shortage in access to housing, adequate income, and the care support necessary. These shortages are readily apparent in the waitlist and accessing services, 15 years for a waitlist accessing life-saving services, 20 years for accessing the basic needs for survival, food, shelter, medication, and support, and maybe another 15 years for a different kind of housing. There are tens of thousands of people with developmental disabilities on these wait lists, children, young people, adults with families working incredibly hard for their survival, and people without families or communities of support. In the face of this austerity, people labeled with developmental disabilities are displaced across a wide range of housing, shelter, prisons, and long-term care homes. I'm going to pay close attention to the more than 10,000 disabled people, not including those in Toronto residences, that are displaced under a an, in an underregulated gray market in, um, service of for-profit institutions. Now, one form of these gray market homes is for-profit settings known as domiciliary hostels. These are also called residential service homes and housing with supports. Of course, they have like 18 other names um, as well. They are municipally regulated, privately operated, and often for-profit institutions for disabled people who are, quote, at risk of homelessness, end quote. And these services were born in the 1950s and came along as privatization really increased. Um, this happened alongside the expansion of privatized long-term care homes and retirement homes. But while long-term care institutions and retirement homes faced increasing provincial regulation through the 2000s, residential service homes became the responsibility of municipalities. Um, 
so the most recent evidence and um, count of these institutions was released during the COVID-19 crisis, and it found that more than 10,000 people were in these institutions. And as of 2009, more than a third of whom were people labeled with developmental disabilities, it's anticipated that these numbers have grown substantially. Now, I use the framework that talks about disability um, using what's called the money model of disablement, which sees that disabled minds and bodies are worth more to the GDP in an institutional bed than in their own. And so we can see how different types of institutions like long-term care homes and domiciliary hostels fill this role. Now we can see here a domiciliary hostel and in the bottom left of the screen, you see the, re the remains of the Rideau Regional Center, uh, the largest, one of the largest um, institutions for people labeled with developmental disabilities that closed in 2009. Now Chardon Manor is a dom hostel located on the little red dot on the map. It's literally across the street. And so we see that there is a real connection between the close of institutions and the real rise of people living in different forms of for-profit institutions, just like this one place. Now, in 1989, a doctor at a hostel found in Hamilton found feces soiling the feet and shoes of an elderly disabled woman. Live maggots were found in one shoe. I'm going to tell you the stories of a few different institutions today, and I want to note that these are not a few bad eggs in the system of privatization. This is a poison bunch poisoned by this system of privatization. So we see here on the screen uh, four different domiciliary hostels located in Ottawa and Ontario. Uh, you can see that the beds are on the bottom right incredibly close together. Um, there's able to be three beds per room in most regions and only one bathroom required for up to 120 residences in other institutions. On the top right, we see the dining area, which is pretty closed and cluttered and a attempt at livening up the room with um, a stick on mural of a beach. And on the top left, we see three beds about a foot apart. Um, during COVID, they were recommended to sleep head to foot to reduce transmission, which of course doesn't actually work. Um, and since the late 1990s, there have been reports, commissions, and investigations detailing the dangerous conditions of these institutions. Like most commissions, the Lightman Commission in 1992 by Ernie Lightman for the Ontario government followed a death. In this instance, the death of Joseph Kendall, a resident of an unlicensed boarding home. Ernie Lightman's commission revealed disturbing conditions inside these institutions, ranging from normalized sexual, physical, financial, and emotional, emotional abuse, a complete lack of fire safety regulations, improper training of staff, and all the way to a lack of empowerment opportunities for residents, so social alienation, and complete isolation. Since this report, which recommended an end to the domiciliary model of housing for people with complex care needs, these institutions have instead evolved and expanded, taking with them the dangerous conditions of privatization. Now, it would be really difficult for domiciliary hostels to be able to outgrow these conditions as the for-profit model and the limited compliance measures make these institutions terrible for both staff and residents alike. And so we have here um, the image of, and so we see here the conditions of privatization. On the scene, on the screen, we see images from a recent, not the 1990s, this is 2022, 
um, a report by the Toronto Star by Diana Slomslick of the Walnut Manor, a domiciliary hostel owned by supportofliving.ca, where health and safety inspectors say they walked past a pair of chest freezers that hadn't worked in at least a month. A staff member said that thawed bags of corn and carrots had turned black with mold. Dead bugs lined the freezer's interior seal, and a rat longer than a football sat in the basement. These are constant. These are not specific to one institution or one residence. But um, when you have only two staff working, both paid minimum wage, and a extremely low operating budget, the only way that institutions are able to generate profit is to reduce all forms of care and service provision. This can range from completely alienating residents and leaving them um, with feces throughout the halls, um, molded food, horrific conditions of bugs and mold. Um, and this is what privatization does. This is how it impacts people. We see here another domiciliary hostel. And I tell this story because I think it's really helpful in understanding how this works. As Pat shared, land is a really important commodity. And so increasingly these residents exist outside of the city limits. And what happens when they're based in the country is there's a lot of um, things that can happen and a lot of isolation that occurs. In the case of the New Market residence, it's located off a highway and there's no shoulders on the highway and so, or sidewalks. And so residents, when they feel the need to leave because it's crowded, maybe it smells bad, maybe they're bored because there isn't any recreation opportunities, um, because as reports note that residents were more likely to go to the doctor than go to a park or movie or leisure activity. And so people wander. They leave the residence often over-medicated because medication is required to pe keep people um, a little bit more calm when th in these horrific conditions. In 2017, a driver stopped just as she was about to hit an older man. He was coated in feces and was accompanied by several others who had fallen into the bush, were heavily medicated and very confused. When the driver was like, what is happening? The owner responded and said, they're all fine. Um, we can't do anything to keep them here. And so this is just what happens. I think that wandering the streets is very fair. I love to go for a little walk. But when you're institutionalized into spaces like this, that it comes with such a high risk. And so um, just this past year in 2022, another person was killed outside of this institution, um, wandering the streets when he was struck by a car. And so privatization has a impact and deadly impact on our communities. It results in conditions that, yes, are incredibly shocking, dehumanizing, and life-altering. But it also, those conditions echo forward into our families, into our relationships, because no one wants to see their child, their friend, their community member, um, their neighbor in conditions that are so violent and so horrific that they attempt to escape or are over-medicated to maintain their calm or are trapped and unable to leave. People don't want to be in these residences. People don't want to be in these institutions, but when we continue to maintain austerity rates for housing, for income supports, and for staffing ratios, it means that these conditions will be duplicated, um, maximized, and expanded. And we can see that not only are these conditions 
maintained. It's been 70 years and at least 50 years of people complaining and highlighting the violence is occurring in them. We can only expect that they will expand and continue to grow as privatization remains um, has a foothold on the developmental services industry. And so it's important to recognize that not only is our domiciliary hostels an incredibly violent entity that is a high risk for disabled people, um, particularly people with developmental disabilities, we can see that unregulating industries, um, removing staffing levels, removing access to supports and services, um, and removing ability to follow various quality assurance measures and regulations puts people in horrific abuse. Now, on the bottom of this screen, we see, or on the screen, we see three more news articles. Um, one which says final days of Hamilton's Emerald Lodge, neglect, disrepair, and dysfunction. Rodents contaminated food, food force closure of St. Thomas, Ontario group home, and group homes need oversight. Now, each of these stories are real, are the stories of our community members, and are the stories of people who experienced recurring harm um, at the hand of the state who doesn't have any accountability because they're able to say, it's just the lodge, it's just the group home, it's just this one regulation. And so we have to fight incredibly hard to resist not only this form of privatization, but all forms of privatization that connect and intersect and build up to these forms of institutionalization that can cause so much harm, violence, neglect, and death. And so I think by being here today, we can recognize that um, privatization is a fundamental and morbid risk to the sector and work needs to go in in order to maintain the safety and protection of our community um, who is at most who is most at risk of these um, interventions. So I think that's the end of my time. Um, I can talk a lot more about these industries. And I will also note that these aren't the only type of gray market housing. I focused in on one industry today, but there is an expansive sector of privatized institutions like domiciliary hostels that play an important role currently in our developmental service system at its current form of privatization, just because austerity makes it pour over from the not-for-profit system into the for-profit system, which serves as a catch-all. And that's, that's it. All right, thanks, Megan. Um, like Pat, you're a little bit ahead of time. You guys are making my job very easy today. Um, so given that we do have a few minutes left, I'm wondering, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that um, domiciliary hostels are municipally regulated. Can you talk a bit about what that means? Like, for example, with respect to quality assurance measures and other things? Yeah, most definitely. So what, um, wait, sorry, can you say that one more time? The captions didn't quite catch the first part. Oh, yes. I'm wondering, so you mentioned uh, that domiciliary hostels are municipally regulated. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a bit more about what that means, how that's different from, for example, um, services that are provincially regulated? Yeah, totally. Um, so both domiciliary hostels and group homes share a lot of commonalities. Uh, one of them is that there's not a lot of data or information on them, but in the case of uh, domiciliary hostels, they don't actually municipalities don't actually have to keep a list or um, 
data source of all of the different domiciliary hostels that are operating in their region that happens on a municipal basis. And so we can get a lot of good data from one municipality, but not from another. Um, another is that there's very little that municipalities can do, especially when they have very minimal um, regulation. And so the only possibility they have is health and safety inspections. And because those frequently occur with warning, um, regulators are able to like clean up their act um, and make it such that it's more difficult to get fined. But it also means that various um, regulatory mechanisms are not included. And so there is no um, no fire marshal, um, no consistent fire marshal reports or commissions for them. And so there doesn't have to be a sprinkler in every room. Um, this past New Year's, there was three domiciliary hostel fires in one night, and the, one of which killed a person. And so we can see that like not having those consistent sprinkler um, policies or directives mean that different regulations will cause different amounts of harm and risk. And then also things like how money is moved through the institution are incredibly compromised. And so in the case of Ottawa, um, because institutional allowances go to the institution at large, and so the people who live there get $149 a month, and that's actually distributed by the institution itself as opposed to by the province. And so quite consistently, we see accounts of financial abuse because there is no streamlined system to get people their money. It happens at the behest of the, the institution who's able to control the funds. Um, but then also things like food standards, safety standards. There's consistent reports that people who are disproportionately diabetic are only eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. That's killing them. That is sending them into diabetic shock that is increasing their the medication that they require um, and that is just nothing is done about it there's nothing that can happen that's just expected of a for-profit agency where they're trying to get the most of their money um, and then we also see things like COVID legislations where DOM hostels weren't considered on the list of high-risk residences and so as a result it meant that they weren't included in the first wave of vaccine rollouts where people had to die in order for the province to pay attention. And the province also wasn't mandated to keep track of COVID cases and counts in these institutions. Uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, another question for you that I think is uh, important. Um, so these are for-profit operators where is the profit coming from? Yeah, the profit comes from flows from the federal government where they are they give money to the province through their emergency uh, homeless measures. From the province, it flows to municipalities um, who get the funding through their various um, emergency and homeless supports. And then the profit comes from, either paying residents where people who aren't on ODSP or um, are not covered to live in a domiciliary hostel have to pay um, above market rent for this, or alternatively, where um, the profits come from is from feeding people only peanut butter and jelly sandwiches um, because they make profit off of cutting every corner possible including in the provision of food, including in only hiring or having two people on staff, including in forcing people to share three bedrooms. And so when you consolidate or cut all of the different um, needs required and services offered, then you're able to skim a little bit off the top and be able to get a profit from this. And because this system is so unregulated it means that like there's lots of corners that can be cut in order for people 
to make any money from the system. And um, last question for you, Megan, uh, similar to what was asked uh, of Pat, um, what are some things, what are some recommendations, policy recommendations that you would have to move forward to uh, improve this? Yeah, I mean, I think the number one policy recommendation is to rapidly increase the supply of public housing um, in all of our cities and increase both um, the cost and amount of income that disabled people are receiving, particularly those who live in institutions. Um, ODSP was increased not by a lot. Um, it needed to be increased by 50%. And people in institutions need to have at least $1,000 a month if they want to be able to get the over-the-counter medication that they need, clothes, uh, Wi-Fi, access to any forms of leisure support or anything to do, um, and also different forms of recreation activities. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, yeah, rapidly expanding ODSP and our stock of public housing that is of good quality, that is accessible for people with various disabilities, um, and that is able to meet various needs, including having things like um, ceiling tracks for people who need transfers and um, various an extra bedroom if someone needs a support worker overnight, because right now we don't have those systems and services in place, making us rely on institutions like domiciliary hostels. Okay, thanks very much, Megan. Uh, I made a plug for Pat's book. I'll make another plug for Megan's uh, podcast, Invisible Institutions, which is amazing. Um, I really appreciate Pat and Megan, both of your time today. Uh, we will comb through the chat comments and questions, and those will help inform um, our future work in this area. And I am pretty certain that we will have at least one more virtual event on this topic. Um, I really appreciate everyone joining us today to giving us an hour of your time, which I know is, is precious. And I'm happy to give you four minutes back to your day. So thank you, everyone.